<laughs> Hello, and uh, welcome to Art Tells a Story, Let It Tell Yours. Um, my name's Janice Lessman Moss, and I'm here today with Andrea Myers to talk about our current art projects. I've known Andrea as a colleague since she joined the faculty at Kent State University in 2015. We both studied textiles in school, so we have similar interest um, in, in using familiar craft processes to make meaning in our artwork. Respectful of the traditions of weaving and quilt making, we bring our personal perspectives to bear in the creation of work using these distinctive languages. And thanks to this invitation from Art Tells a Story, we're happy to have this opportunity to share ours with you. Um, but before we get started, um, we have a trivia question, which is apparently custom of this uh, program. Um, and our question for you today is when was the Jacquard loom invented? What year was the Jacquard loom invented? Uh, and the winner of that trivia, if, if you get the answer to that question, um, you get a gift certificate uh, for $25 from Lemongrass Restaurant. So good luck. <clears throat> Hi, Janice. So, Hi, Andrea. How are you doing? <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Um, I should also say before I start talking about my work, and both Janice and I are going to talk about our work and then just have some dialogue about our projects and process, um, that because of storms last night, I've been having some internet issues. So I'm, right now I'm on a hot spot with my computer and phone. So if I disappear, I'll call in and figure it out. But just in case anything gets disrupted... <laughs> further disrupted from, from uh, what we've been doing. But yeah, so I, I guess we're gonna start by looking at some images um, of my recent projects. Um, and most recently, February, 2020, I went to Germany to install a project. And then also I was in Dallas uh, the beginning of March, uh, right before the, like literally the day of the quarantine happening to um, a second state. And um, just let me interrupt one one second here, Andrea. Um, we are having a little technical problem already because I can't screen share. One thing we forgot to check, um, I need to be able to screen share. So we'll get that up in a second because the images are so fabulous and Andrea's story really comes to life with the images. Uh, you've been enabled, I think, to do it. Yes. <laughs> here we go. Yeah. <laughs> we're ready. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we're, we're visual people. So Janice and I wanted to give you lots of visuals <laughs> of things we've been up to. So yeah, as I was saying, so um, this first image, um, I had a, I have a solo exhibition at um, the textile museum in uh, Eastern Germany. And it was um, a connection I made through doing the, the artist exchange through the Greater Columbus Arts Council. I went to Dresden in 2018 for two months. So these images are just um, kind of the before and during installation at the museum, but there was a material exchange that I established with the curator at the museum. So you see in the upper left there, some technical textiles she was sending. Um, I like the arrow. Uh, so they're usually used for construction garments or firefighters, but she, she thought because I use a lot of neon in my work, it would be a really nice fit for me to um, integrate those into the sewing that I was already doing. There's also in the bottom left-hand corner, this uh, jacquard loom weaving that the, um, the museum still produces this iconic, it's called Roar into Hirsch, which means like, um, I think it's like a, a yelling deer, I think is the loose translation. But so she was giving me that to also integrate into this um, site-specific installation I was gonna do at the museum. And so I started thinking about what was the what was another utilitarian material that I could integrate into the project? And I I started thinking about denim and how for me that feels like a universal utilitarian material that everyone is familiar with. Most everyone owns jeans. And as I was thinking about that as another material that I could add into the conversation, I realized that it's also was a really important symbol of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which had its 30th anniversary last year. So things were all Lining up, oops, if you go to the next image, I thought, but <laughs> thanks. Um, so what we ended up doing is I um, got 
jeans from the thrift stores in Ohio. And then the museum curator had a call out to the public to have them donate uh, their worn jeans. And so I was able to use both of those um, supplies to create this wall of denim that I felt was an abstraction of the, the legs of the people sitting on top of the Berlin Wall, but also references like a skyscape um, and also references like brick patterning. So that's, this was like the first layer that I was putting up on the wall. And I went to, so I was in this small town for about a, a week um, installing February 1st and the 7th of this year. Um, so I, I put up that background and then I started adding the layers of patchwork color over top of it. I wanted that to feel like it could be graffiti or clouds passing or holes in the wall or like all of the above um, to then further the movement in the piece um, and, and relate it back to the other pieces that I've done recently too. So, um, yeah. So Andrea, is that the first time that you've put together that kind of uh, um, really stable or architectural kind of ground with this really dynamic, active uh, plane running in front of it? Because it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. This is this is one of the larger installations I've done up until the, this point. I mean, I did a commission for Facebook corporate offices in 2018, um, which kind of it was like a uh, patchwork fabric moving around the space, but this was a, this is an entire covering of a wall and, and yeah, really transforming the space. And I also was really excited about the fact that because the, the public was donating their denim to it, then the viewer was starting to be embedded into the actual work, which I found really interesting too. And um, I guess uh, the curator said that anyone who donated jeans had like free admission to the museum. So it's like, you can kind of go and find where your jeans are in, in my pieces. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what the next image is. And then this is the, the finished piece. Um, and I liked just architecturally too, how it interacted with the, the floor um, and the linear quality and um, a lot of the, the use of scale in my work, I feel like relates to color field painting in a way where I want to start really enveloping and immersing the viewer and using this material fabric and denim. And I mean, fabric is around us in every aspect of our lives, whether it's in our clothing or just on our beds or in our cars or everywhere. So um, I find it to be a really um, tactile, approachable and familiar material. And I, I feel like that is, something that can draw people to want to you know it's like haptic in that way it makes people want to touch and, and interact with the piece so. yeah that's cool yeah. well you know andrea is working with cloth that's already constructed and manipulating it and collaging it but i'm making the fabric itself um and i wanted to show you an uh, images of my studio uh, to give you a sense of the equipment that I use. And these, this is a loom that I'm working on. It's a digital jacquard loom. Um, and there's another digital jacquard loom in the background. It's a little bit larger, but this little tiny baby loom is just a fabulous tool. And I have really enjoyed using it while we've been in quarantine. It's been really a fun um, kind of tool to work with. And because of its uh, immediate kind of connection to the body. I mean, there I am standing right in front of it and it's my size. And that has obviously influenced the size of the work I can make. I can only make it as wide as the loom is, but I like kind of confronting it there um, in a physical way right in front of me. Um, and you can see that the tools that I use um, include the computer which talks to the loom. Um, I have another computer where I do my designing uh, and when I'm working on the loom, the warp is the thread that's on the loom and it's been painted. And I like to paint things so that uh, they have a, a little bit more of an atmospheric kind of quality to them, the touch of the hand, if you will, because once I really start weaving, uh, the loom is really following the directions that I've coded um, in my design. And so I don't have a lot of wiggle room except to kind of play with color and material as I work. And this is that, that kind of blueprint or that design that I send to the computer. 
Um, and this is um, a black and white blueprint and the black uh, references the warp showing and the white references the weft showing. Um, so this is the final design that I would send to the loom and the loom would know how to read this row by row. And as it's reading it, then I am inserting my weft thread as I go along. Um, but I wanted to kind of take you through the process of designing. Uh, and I work with a, a series of templates as when I start my designs. And the templates, um, I, I like to have that kind of matrix or that root that um, the, the, the kind of all of the shapes kind of derive from that. So there's a definite kind of connection, a conversation, an easy kind of harmonious relationship of the layers as they are constructed on uh, in the virtual world of the computer. Um, so I start building, I start selecting sections of these colored uh, templates and those sections are selected in a sequential way. I move from the top of the field to the bottom of the field in what I refer to as my path. And I liken that to, you know, like walking um, and moving from one place to another. And then I fill in the back of the template so that I can see what I have in terms of my paths. I outline the paths. I uh, flip the paths in the virtual world of the computer gives you so many options, the luxury of kind of manipulating things um, in, that you don't have to physically do. Uh, and then I start layering. So I'm working again with all these simple ingredients that are working, that are based in the circle within the square, but I'm layering them together so that I come up with my final composition. And again, that's what goes to the loom. I have the option to kind of work with whatever materials I want. Um, and Andrea and I were talking today about, um, you know, kind of using materials and our, our love of textiles. Um, and I started working with this wire as a way to kind of interject some reflective quality or some luminate, lumina, luminous, excuse me, material into the field in contrast to this other material, which is a wax linen material. And it is kind of matte and it is um, very hard. Uh, so both the materials are hard and it really emphasizes more the tactility of, of the piece. Yeah, I like, I like, I don't know, I'm really drawn to hearing you talk about um, just the embodiment of your work and the connection to the body and paths and walking and touch of hand. And so, I don't know, and also in your titling too. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about, and I can also, but just how um, being physically in the world influences what you're making and how that gets woven into your, into your work. Were you talking, Andrea? I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Did you? Um... I don't know, but I think I can. I can. I had. A, I felt like I had a pretty juicy question for you. <laughs> um, I was just saying that as you were talking, I was really drawn to you. Like I wrote down these things of like how the connection to the body and touch of hand and these paths that you're you're walking and you're also in your titling of your work. So I just kind of wanted to talk about like how. Um, your embodiment comes through and your weaving or like being a, a physical person in a physical world, which I feel like you're, you're talking about, um, or like you, you say you go on walks. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about how our physical life experience and environments impacts what you're making. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. And I think we have that in common too, um, that we both enjoy walking. And I use, um, I, there's a, a mathematical theory called the random walk. And I base that decision-making about moving the path down the field in what is referred to as the random walk. It, I mean, I'm not following the scientific theory specifically, but I use it as kind of an inspiration. Um, and the random walk means that when you don't kind of move in a straight line, you move either slightly to the right or slightly to the left. That's a you know very general kind of statement. But anyway, that's the way I kind of move down the field and that creates that kind of lyrical movement and that fluid movement that allows me to kind of create those paths. Um, and, and it's the physical output of the weaving that really is so satisfying to me after having 
worked with the vir virtual, within the virtual world to create the designs. It's the output of the piece on the loom, that physical activity, the moving. Um, when, when you're weaving, it's very similar to the way you experience kind of walking in that it's a, it's a rhythmic activity. And when you're outside walking, of course, you're moving through space in a very uh, rhythmic way. But even though I might walk the same route every day when I'm on my walks, um, I still discover new things. And when I'm weaving, in fact, it's not really me that's moving, it's the weaving that's moving. So I'm having that same kind of experience, discovering things and noticing things and seeing details in the work that kind of come to me as I build the um, composition. So it's, it's really kind of invigorating and inspiring. Yeah, and it also makes me think about just, and I think we both have this in common of our processes also are about uh, slowing down and there is a labor to them. Um, and I talked to you a little bit about how I feel like it's a meditational act in a way. Like yes. When I'm sitting at the sewing machine, I kind of just have a pile of strips of fabric and I just kind of make quick decisions and I'm passing it back and forth, like a, kind of like doing a physical drawing on the surface. Mm -hmm. But then that just made me think also that we're both really close up to what we're working on. And right. because with your weavings, you don't take them off until the very end, right? right. You're, you're finishing it. For me, I'm working in sections and then kind of putting it up on the wall and patchworking it. But it's still that, that kind of intimacy or proximity. And then you kind of get to push away and, and see it. So I don't know. Those are some other kind of connections I'm making about just walking and, and slowing down and slow movement and all that is interesting to me. Well, yeah, and the pieces that you have now coming up um, are just great examples of that same kind of sense of momentum or movement that's moving through appears to be kind of um, tra tra um, transversing a, a landscape um, mm -hmm. or some kind of a, a um, an outdoor environment. And I think that's um, a really interesting kind of parallel. So when you do these, Andrea, you were just saying that you are building them kind of in sections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to pull up the next, because are we up to the point where the, the piece I made for Dallas and I see that like in, the in progress, should I pull that up or? Are yeah. You are you not seeing? Cause I'm seeing them. Cause that's your Dallas piece. I've got it up on the screen right now. I'm not seeing it. Oh God. <laughs> and I try to do share screen, but I'm not, I have, I need permission to do it. So now I'm a co-host, so now I can do it. So maybe let me try. Go ahead. You, you start because I'm having some issues here with my That's computer. Little... And I didn't have a storm last night. So what do you know? There we go. Let me pull it up here really quick. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, so this was a piece that I was making kind of at the same time of, of that um, piece I made in or making components of the piece for Germany. I guess I didn't say that. I worked in sections on that and then put it all in a suitcase. Um, and there was a lot of improvisation and kind of little crossing my fingers that I was gonna have enough material and all that in the Germany project. But so this was a um, all connected large scale. It's about eight by 20 foot um, textile piece. And so like I was saying, I work in these incremental sections. Um, and I like to take process images just so I can see how the piece is evolving. And I also like to take photos of this because um, my studio space isn't huge. So I don't have like a, an eight by 20 foot continuous wall, but as artists, and I feel like you and I, Janice, were talking about this earlier today, um, how to adapt as artists right. like during quarantine of like, you know, I, I feel like, um, there's a lot of creative problem solving that artists enjoy. So it's like, I had the opportunity to make, this is me working on the floor. So again, it's like, you kind of make do with the space that you have and um, knowing that there's gonna be some challenges that come up. And I think I, I like those, whether I know they're gonna be showing up or not to react to um, some problems that come up in pieces. And um, there's some great quote about how designers, it's like designers, solve problems and artists make problems or something like that but <laughs> that always kind of resonates with me because I feel like artists we we come up with these just 
puzzles in a way that we want to solve for ourselves. So that one of the one of the puzzles of this piece was okay, how do I get it to pass through the sewing machine, the kind of finite space between the needle and the arm of the sewing machine. Um, and then I, I ended up making it in two sections and then sewing those two sections together when I had the two pieces done. But also um, the nature of forcing bulky material through a sewing machine space creates this rippling and undulation of the surface, which I, I like that. And I can't really control that a lot of the time. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of, I think I've used this word a few times today, but improvisation or gesture to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then um, these photos are just scale wise to see. And there's the um, gallery director's daughter on the floor there. But I also like that photo because you can see the color reflecting in the, in the floor. <laughs> so, yeah. But we had talked a little bit about pixelation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that because we, we did mention the and making the, the connection to the physical kind of working, but you've talked about pixels in your work. And of course I'm working with pixels all the time. And I wondered about how you relate to that concept because you are working with these really regular kind of motifs mm -hmm. um, and which is somewhat customary to quilt making, right? But yours are pretty distinctive in terms of their, really their presence and the fact that they are not only kind of filling a space, but they're also creating that dynamic energy. So do you have, I mean, and, and you think about those in terms of, of a pixelization of the landscape? Yeah, I mean, I, when I first started making these, I didn't really think about it in terms of pixelation, although... I was thinking about it um, recently and I have a printmaking background as an undergraduate. And um, so I did a lot of screen printing in that and you're separating out layers so that there's you're, there's um, uh, pixelization in the, the prints you're making and they have to, you know, they have to line up to get the, the image. So maybe somewhere in my subconscious, it's also just kind of in, intuitive in, in my process, but um, it's also just the nature of fabric and how it comes in a rectangular format because of the, the weave of it and that you can cut it or tear it into rectangles. And so I think that's, you know, it, it, it seemed like the most efficient use of the material. Um, and also that cutting process for me, I feel is gestural and meditative that I'm just the, the repetitive nature of just cutting um, different um, sizes and then at the sewing machine I'm, I'm paneling them together and making color decisions on the spot so and they also kind of read as brush strokes too I think so there's a relationship to painting um, in that way yeah but, yeah um, and then here's just some more details so uh, yeah again like I because of the space at the at the gallery, I knew that they had large continuous walls and it was a challenge for me. I wanted to make a piece <clears throat> that related to color field painting or it felt immersive and that it could really fill up the, the peripheral vision of the viewer and have that and have that as a, um, a challenge for my work. So. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, so I've got a few more pieces here for you to look at and it gives you a sense of Again, the, the the variations that I work with within that kind of um, system of circles and squares uh, with the layering and the metallic um, inserts. Uh, this shows you kind of a, uh, uh, an, a use of two colors in the weft. And that's one of the things I really have fun with when I'm working is color. And, you know, you have such a great touch with your color and it's so dynamic and um, vivid. And I enjoy that kind of quality of color too. It's a little harder to put it all into a small piece, but nonetheless, I, I like working with the color. Um, and these, these pieces, I've the ones that I'm showing you have all been done since I since we've been in quarantine. And you'll notice the title, Dancing with the Distance. And that is um, a reference to one of my husband's songs. And I asked him to send me the song because I hadn't, I hear him singing it all the time, but I didn't put it into the proper context. So I have here that it's from the chorus, from the way it, it is to the way it was, what it doesn't do to what it does, from where I am to where I'd rather be, I'm dancing with the distance here between. 
And I love that sentiment and particularly in light of the, um, the quarantine. So he write that was this during quarantine that he wrote that song? I think it was right before quarantine, but everything was crazy in the world at that time. So I think it definitely influenced the lyrics. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I love the, the push and pull of your surfaces and, and what you're your your palette, color palette, but also just the layering of visual patterning and information. Um, and I was thinking about that today in terms of, of when you're in Photoshop and you have all these layers and then you have that ability to flatten down and to make it one. Right. Um, and how that relates to when I use applique because I'm physically doing that, like kind of forcing layers together. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It just and also the this element of the reflective quality of the the wire and how that is, you know, brings the viewer in and it acts as these kind of like um, bright spots or focal points. So maybe talk about that a little bit of of that. You want to go to the next ones because those are also very yeah. similar. And again, they just continue on in that vein. And yeah, I love the fact that we're both working with patterns, and yet there's the outcome is so distinctly different. And there's, um, I think in your work, I really feel a touch of the hand and that really direct physical connection. I think maybe because of the streamlined quality of my marks, they have a, a little bit less of a, um, of a sense of touch, which is again, why I paint the warps. And you can see in these examples that I have uh, really varied colors. And and I think that that really adds to the pieces because they're, the uh, motifs are so graphic. Um, and this gives it that kind of push and pull. It really emphasizes that, I think, a little bit more. And, um, and again, the notion of using the, um, the wire, it's hard to see the pieces really well here um, because of the fact that they're, they're hard to document. You, you really get a different perspective or different perception of the wire as you move around the piece. So it's really nice to kind of see them in person as it is with all art, right? I mean, we need to, to see our work um, live and that kind of tactility of our work really comes through when we see it in person rather than projected. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, yeah. <laughs> I love the like, they have like a op art hypnotic <laughs> effect. Yeah, yeah, and that they, so it's it's interesting to me that they can feel very like planar, but then also that it's this depth that can kind of be flat, but then open up. So it, that I guess it's like a pulsing or something. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I think the last few images are mine, right? <laughs> no, I think I have a couple more in there, but we are yeah. running. We are getting kind of tight on time, so. Right. A little technical difficulty. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, gonna, I'll just briefly talk about the next few images of, I think, and we can end maybe talking about how quarantine has impacted our work. But these are just some images of, so um, after getting back from Dallas and going into quarantine and also, you know, teaching remotely, um, also being a, a teacher to a fourth grader at home, like all the things, I, I found myself being really drawn to quick collage methods and looking around my studio and I, I save a lot of cast off and remnants and um, paper remnants from other projects. So what could I use in my studio that I had just kind of been saving for a rainy day to make some quick series and just play a little bit more, especially when um, I'm busy with commissions or other projects. I don't, sometimes I don't feel like I have the time to just experiment. Mm -hmm. So, and also these were building like this piece, it's pretty large, but I was doing them on, on 14 by 17 inch paper at the kitchen table while, you know, being around my daughter and just kind of we're all like, you know, uh, cooking and doing school and all the things happening at home all at once. But so it, it felt like a really um, helpful outlet to, again, and they're very related to my textile pieces of this um, repetitive gesture of cutting rectangular strips of the paper and then collaging them. But I also like, Andrea, too, and, you know, that you really follow through on that kind of quality of sustainability or resourcefulness that is so, um, you know, common to textile artists at, from since the beginning of time. 
and mm -hmm. you're using what's around. And I mean, I think these are other examples of you using materials that are available and really creatively, you, you know, using them in, in, in wonderful and varied ways, diverse ways. So, um, you know, maybe you, are you conscious of that decision to you, reuse? Yeah, I think it definitely, the longer I've been a practicing artist, it is a, a deeper consideration. And I think artists in general, yeah, we are very responsible. And even with my students, they're like, I don't know why, but I've been collecting these bottle caps for the last 10 years. And it's like, I, I feel like artists, and maybe talking about your walks too. I love taking walks because you, you can see things or find things uh, on the ground or in nature that can be really inspiring, whether you're actually physically using them in your work or it just sits on your shelf and you're like, well, I want to draw that, you know? So, um, so yeah, as I was kind of like dissecting these jeans and had all the, these seams and hems and triangular weird shapes left over, I have um, 150 pockets that I'm hoping to do a, a public piece Amazing. with sometime in the near future. So it's really hard. It's hard for me to throw things away. And I feel like a lot of artists it's like, I'm not a hoarder, I'm a collector. And there's, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, these were all, these were pieces that, because I had all that, um, all those jeans I was cutting up, I had these remnant materials. So we can look at and your- Just uh, drawings. And I know that you've got some drawings to show us as well. And, and thinking about, again, versus the digital versus the analog kind of drawings. But this, if you look real closely, those of you who are watching, um, they, these are three different drawings and you can see how I kind of work through the final stages of my planning on the, in the virtual world of the computer. And I change the circle sizes, I change the way they kind of pull forward in space. Um, and those gray spots are meant to re um, represent where the metal will be inserted in the weft. And if you go to the next slide, Andrea, that's, um, you can see that piece then translated into actual form. And if you look at these three pieces, the piece on the right, the full view, but those are silver nickel plated copper um, inserts and they look black. And so as you move around the piece, it kind of trans, uh, you know, it, it moves with you. And it's kind of exciting to, again, I look at those as kind of little harbingers of hope um, they're light and um, they are reflective and they, you know, they just add a little bit of brightness to this time in our lives. And I think that, you know, in response to kind of thinking about quarantine, they, they really make me feel good um, to just kind of sense that kind of optimism in the work. And you can see that when you move around the piece, the piece on the left is also, you, you kind of lose the silver. You can see it when it's being woven and then it really translates differently when you're in front of it. Yeah. So I know in, in your drawings, you, you're you approaching your work yeah. differently. I know, I thought I'd put in an example because um, I've been keeping a sketchbook since I was probably you know, in high school. And um, I was explaining to Janet that I'll have an idea at some point and it just kind of is, you know, in my mind's eye and it's bugging me enough that I need to get it down really quick. And I, and it, I'll redraw it and redraw it until it gets to the point where, okay, I'm going to make this piece or it's, it's also for me, it's like catching the ideas when I have them. So drawing in a sketchbook is almost like journaling where it's like, I, I can get things out immediately and then I can go back and, and think about them some more. So these are just some examples. Um, and then, then the, the pieces that I have made during quarantine, um, again, using remnant um, collage, like discarded pieces from other pieces or leftovers and looking at applique or again, playing with the space, like doing more of this um, installation where there's this big um, drop on the wall and then this folded version on kind of echoing it on the ground. Um, and I was talking to Janice earlier too about teardrop shape or the eye shape and how it could you know be like a raindrop or tears or and I think springtime but also it was you know it was a springtime but it was also this collective grief that we've all been going through um, and that would kind of find me in strange moments you know um, so again like 
remembering that artists, we use art making as catharsis and a way to process and, and view the world and translate feeling into form. Um, it's kind of like, sometimes we forget that. <laughs> and there's a lot of humanity in the work that we make. So um, and I just have this detail shot, but I can exit my screen sharing. We can chat a little bit, kind of wrap up things. Um, if I can do this, here we go. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of things that we we needed to talk about, but we it looks like we're getting short on time. So I, I'm I'm holding my questions. Yeah. Um, Janice, I guess maybe as an endpoint, is there anything from this time? I I think this is a fun question just to ask friends or family, but during quarantine, that you would um, want to like maybe a new habit or something that you've started that you're gonna or just a realization that you would continue forward, whether or not we, you know, depending on quarantine state or. I, you know, I don't, I don't think that, that anything uh, comes to mind off the top of my head. Um, I, I'm pretty much working the way I have been. The way quarantine has affected me most significantly is with teaching more so than with my art. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's incredibly stressful, um, I find solace in my work. And I think I, I was mentioning to you before that I, I really think it's an important time to have art with you in your environment. And we are so fortunate because not only do we have, um, you know, art that we make, but we also have friends that we've gotten art from. And um, so we're, we're lucky, but um, the notion of, of having an object that brings you joy and brings beauty into your life and brings meaning into your life. And the, you know, a, a good piece of art is like a good book. And I keep listening to the same books over and over, books on tape. Okay. And, you know, a good story, when you hear it again, it, it always kind of feeds you in a different way. You know, you hear something different, you notice something different the next time and the next time and the next time. And I always feel like that's the way with a, a really good um, piece of art, good music. You know, you, you just approach it differently depending on the frame of mind you're in or the light or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it makes me maybe more aware and more sensitive to the details in life and the things that bring pleasure and, um, you know, happiness. Yeah. I think that's a really, that's a really great answer. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, I just, it makes me think of going to a museum, um, and you have favorite pieces in a collection and yeah. you go see that piece. And it, as you're changing as a person in your life, it's going to yeah. be a little bit different, but it still has a kind of like a, a thread or a resonance from the first time you saw it. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, That's great. Very powerful. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. It's been so know. nice talking to you. No, <laughs> I love, I love thinking about the overlaps in our work and yeah, um, yeah I don't know if we need to re-ask the trivia question. Oh yeah. You saying yes. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, the question was, uh, when was the Jacquard loom invented? That's And then if you answer correctly, you get a $25 gift certificate to Lemongrass. And, that's, and then you can go to Hammond Harkin. See, this is great segue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right next door. And then you go see their new show, Hashtag From the Studio, which we both have work in. <laughs> yes. There. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Well, thank you. This has been really great. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks so much. This has been great. And yeah, so thanks everyone for taking the time. Yeah, for tuning in. Bye.